Check, check. One, two. Yeah, this thing works better. characters right there. My IRC nickname is basically my email without the uh, anything after that. And uh, I am the, the, one of the maintainers of the FFmpeg AAC encoder. Now I'm sure that uh, you all know that the FFmpeg AAC encoder is uh, horrible and in fact uh, one of the speakers here, Alex Gompers, uh, are you there? Yep. Nice. He was the original um, guy who merged the AC encoder, so he knows best uh, about it. it. It was terrible, all right? It's pretty bad. <laughs> so, uh, I, I have one... Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the I official don't... name was AC Bitstream Writer. Bitstream <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Writer, yeah, yeah that, sounds, uh, that sounds about right. So, I don't want you getting depressed over the fact that, uh, you know, the decoder is still terrible and that it will never get merged and, you know, all that stuff. So I'm just going to announce this straight away that we are going to remove the uh, experimental flag in FFmpeg for the AC encoder in a few days, which I define as a few days after I return from this conference because I cannot even get a full here. Engineering is horrible. So, uh, so yeah, we are going to remove the experimental flag. We are doing better than LibMDK at some bit rates and at some audio content, especially at uh, at the lower end at around. Uh, 128 kilobits per second, so we're doing pretty well. It was terrible at around, uh, at around April, but uh, then I started committing, and uh, then uh, Claudio, is, uh, who is the other guy who's uh, maintaining the AC encoder, is very nearly uh, completed with his, uh, uh, with his work, uh, which came from the plus 400 comment uh, FFmpeg uh, bug tracker uh, thread. Which I'm sure many of you are, uh, you know, still ridicule. I mean, 400 comments, and it, it just like that. So, I am here to talk about the evolution of the AC encoder, which I just did. It was merged in 2009 by Alex, Gom uh, Alex Gombers there, and uh, it was uh, originally a GSOC project. And uh, yeah, there wasn't much work done on it uh, up until now. And uh, yeah. And the advanced coding techniques available in AEC. So, unlike the DAO guys, I'm actually talking. I'm actually going to give a little introduction, so that uh, you guys know at least uh, what I'm talking about, yeah. rather than just <laughs> blocking filters and stuff like that. So let's begin. Oh. Come on. Yeah. All right. Uh, the very first thing that you want to do if you want to compress the signal is that you turn it into the frequency domain because. Uh, if you try to compress audio, just raw PCM, you're not really going to get much compression because there's very little correlation between every time sample. So what you do is you apply a window so that your uh, MDCT results make sense, and uh, you apply the MDCT, uh, MDCT transform and you get uh, amplitudes. And those amplitudes are mapped to frequencies. So you see how this, uh, this uh, audio signal kind of has a peak at, uh, at around the midpoint. Uh, that's Clearly, because it's a sine wave, and sine waves uh, usually uh, tr have a Fourier transform, which is just a single peak, because that's what it is. And um, yeah, I put the psi system up there because uh, because of the next slide. This is how the windows in the AAC uh, encoder are specified in the specifications. So you can have four different types of windows, and uh, three of them are basically the same thing, except uh, you know there are minor variations, but none of the uh, encoder extensions or coding tools actually uh, uh, look at uh, whether a window is a long window or a start window or a stop window. They only look if, uh, if the current window is a short window. 
which, uh, which kind of looks like that. And in fact, there are exactly eight uh, short filters inside uh, used once, uh, once the PSI system uh, actually determines that they need to be used. They are used in uh, transient conditions, so that means that there's uh, usually some very fast change in, uh, in, uh, in frequency or in content, and, uh, and, the decoder, and uh, the encoder is going to be way more efficient if it just uh, uses eight short windows. So the, they're a special thing because, uh, the, because, first of all, they indicate a special change uh, in the audio signal, so you don't want to use prediction on you, and you don't want to use uh, perception noise substitution. You just want to uh, to get the maximum efficiency out of it because it's 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 a rapid change. It's going to be hard to encode uh, no matter how you look at it. So after you've applied the window <clears throat> and you've applied the MCDCT, the uh, AC encoder specifications demand that you structure the uh, that you structure the coefficients resulting from the MDCT transform into scale factor bands. And each scale factor band uh, has its own uh, coefficients uh, to which it's mapped to, and it has its own band type. Now, these are the Hoffman uh, code book uh, band types. So here you put either, uh, either it's a zero, so you don't encode the coefficients within this group, or you put, uh, or you put um, for instance, noise, so you, again, don't encode the coefficients, or uh, in this stereo where you don't know the coefficients, or, uh, or for instance, you're called a, a quote unsigned pair of, of coefficients. So it's a complex thing. It's, in, it's within the quantization uh, bits of the encoder. Also, each scale factor band has its scale factor index. Now, this scale factor index is actually referred to as a scale factor inside the decoder, but uh, we refer to it as a scale factor index because we only deal with quantized scale factor indices. And, uh, what scale factor indices basically determine is the uh, kind of the amount of uh, energy uh, that's within a single scale factor band that's within those coefficients. And finally, knowing all of these, you can uh, finally address the spectral coefficients. All right, so AC uh, describes quite a lot of coding tools. And uh, as you can see, most of them are really optional. For instance, MS, uh, MS coding is optional prediction, intensity, uh, TNS, gain control, and uh, independently switching, uh, switch coupling. Uh, not shown here is, uh, that because this table is actually taken from the uh, MPEG-2 specifications. Uh, PNS was introduced with MPEG-4, so was uh, AC-LTP, so was ACHE. and funny story, it was actually uh, made by a Swedish company who then, um, who then decided to try and put it onto other codecs. So they tried to make uh, MP3 Pro first, uh, which uh, failed, but it kind of stuck on to AAC and, uh, and uh, it was finally made standard in 2003, I think, with, uh, with MPEG-4. And uh, ACHE, I think it was 2007, and it's basically just uh, ACHE, nothing changed, and uh, parametric stereo. And uh, yeah, I'm going to talk about all of them. So this is the encoder chain, and uh, you can see how uh, how all these uh, special extensions have their own block in there. Uh, let me just point it out. Yeah, see this thing? That special processing, and uh, the TNS, intensity prediction, and MS are here, but that's just the uh, the MPEG-2 order. What we have in the encoder is actually PNS right about here, and we also have uh, long-term prediction (LTP) which is right around here somewhere. Also, our encoder is a bit different because uh, we don't actually write the bitstream until the very end. So we just catch stuff and, uh, and for instance, if the prediction system wants to override MS or if PNS uh, wants to override some other system or if MS wants to override PNS, uh, we let it do that. We just, uh, we just let it unplug PNS so that uh, we, have a, we have a bit more flexibility in, uh, in actually uh, encoding a file. Then you have uh, scaling, uh, quantization, and, uh, and Huffman coding. We also have, uh, right around uh, where the block switching is, we have a coder. And what the coder does is determine the scale factor indices and, uh, and the preliminary band types. The band types are going to be determined uh, right at the end after every single, uh, uh, right after every single special processing uh, extension has been done. 
and, uh, and yeah, I'm going to talk about that in a bit. So let's start. First of all, perceptual noise substitution. What it does is it operates on scale factor bands, it unzeroes uh, zero bands, replaces non-zero bands with noise, and sees bit by not having to encode the spectral coefficients. And in a nutshell, what perceptual noise substitution does is it looks at uh, the start of the uh, scale factor bands, uh, the start of the coefficients to which uh, the scale factor band is mapped to, and it fills those uh, coefficients with just random noise, which then gets scaled by, by whatever you determine that your energy is, so you just get the energy from the, uh, from the uh, psychoacoustic system. And uh, you just uh, don't encode the spectral coefficients because there is no point. And uh, you indicate the code book, you indicate the energy in the scale factor band, and you transmit it. So in the end, the result, uh, well, this is the original spectrum. And uh, as you can see, it has uh, quite a lot of uh, high frequencies. Uh, it kind of uh, stops uh, having high frequencies uh, around uh, two points. And, um, and yeah, if you encode it without perceptual noise substitution, you can see how the spectrum gets cut off at around, uh, uh, what is it, 16 kilohertz? And uh, it's going to sound like, uh, like a very high quality uh, tape recorder, basically, if, uh, if anyone's uh, old enough to actually use one of those. And uh, yeah, it's not very pleasant, but uh, you know, it's, it's a low bitrate signal-ish. You know, it's uh, 128 uh, kilobits. This is with the old uh, coder. The new coder, which uh, is going to get merged in a few days by Claudio, is going to improve the results much better since uh, it tends to avoid zeroing out any bands unless it really, really needs to. So the perceptual noise substitution job is going to get easier, but for now, uh, perceptual noise substitution basically looks like this. It, uh, it loses some of the, uh, some of the uh, detail in the, uh, in the highs, but, uh, but hey, it, 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 it introduces noise. And uh, without, uh, without considering the phase of each coefficient, so the end result will be a bit inaccurate, but uh, it restores highs, and uh, the end result is uh, you get much better looking spectrum, and you get much better uh, sounding results. You also, um, I just move uh, down the slide. It is applied by first only considering uh, scale factor bands with coefficients uh, starting at over 4.5 kilohertz. So uh, first of all, it determines uh, the energy by, uh, versus the psychoacoustic threshold. And uh, what this basically means is it fetches the uh, it fetches the energy values and the, and the threshold values from the uh, psychoacoustic system. And what the threshold values determine is, uh, can you hear that much energy? So if, you can't, if the energy is below the threshold, that means you cannot hear it. However, um, uh, it needs to be a bit, bit more flexible than that because, uh, because uh, the, the size system actually depends on the bit rate and, uh, and uh, how hard of a time the decoder is having encoding the signal. So it might uh, increase the threshold to zero out more bands at, uh, at lower bit rates. So you want some flexibility in that, and you want to be able to override some of the uh, non-PNS bands, which the coder has already said are not going to be zeros. So uh, that's uh, what you do with that. Then you have the uh, scale factor band energy spread, and what the scale factor band energy spread does is it tells you, uh, based on the coefficients which are found within the scale factor band, if there's a peak in there. So the higher the spread, the, the higher the uniformity within the scale factor band. So uh, you, can think of a, the, you can think of noise as just having a constant, uh, constant amplitude, like, uh, like we saw here. You can see how at the tops you have, uh, you have uh, uniformity. I'm talking about within the, uh, the, time, uh, the time spectrum. So th this signal is mostly uniform at around the tops, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, due to quantization error, you get this banding at the top, but it doesn't matter since it's noise, basically. So uh, the energy uh, spread basically uh, allows you to determine what, what is noise and what is, uh, what is for instance, uh, the tonal information. So if you have some uh, very strong tonal information within the, uh, within, within the scale factor bands coefficients, then uh, you probably uh, don't want to use uh, PNS and, uh, because it's tone. You will just replace some high-pitched hissing, uh, you know, high-pitched whine with, uh, with noise. And you don't really want to do that. Uh, you want to either let the decoder uh, let the coder uh, zero out the bands or uh, or um, allow it to continue. 
and then you have the energy quantization error, and uh, this is the uh, this is what's put inside the scale factor uh, the scale, uh, scale factor index for that uh, scale factor band, and uh, there is quite an error within the um, within the noise uh, amplitude since it's usually going to be very low uh, low um, low energy. So uh, for some reason, the specification is actually don't uh, don't put the uh, Exact uh, exact quantization uh, required. The, you need to add an offset, and we use uh, plus three, which is a huge value. But the spectrum looks light. I mean, uh, you can see how the perceptual noise substitution, uh, you know, stuff bands have uh, about the same energy as uh, as the uh, as the original signal. So uh, it it's what works best. I mean, it's a deco it's an encoder, so we, uh, we can do whatever we want to. So moving on, so this saves us quite a lot of bits and it adds quite a lot of quality. So uh, th so this is nice. The next one is uh, TNS. That's temporal noise uh, noise shaping, and uh, what it does is it operates on a single window, which usually there is only a single window, and uh, it basically does LPC of uh, of the spectral coefficients, which is kind of unusual because when you think of LPC, you think of low bandwidth stuff like uh, telephoning applications. So you try to get the envelope of the uh, the human speech and the time domain, or uh, no, in, actually in the speak, uh, in the spectral domain. And uh, this uses it a bit of a non-standard way because uh, it's actually a full uh, a full band signal, and. Um, after it determines the LPC, that it, uh, it uh, applies a multi-tap fur filter onto the uh, onto the spectral coefficients belonging to that window, and it can be slid in any direction. Actually, it can be slid in either uh, you know uh, going up or going down, and uh, actually no uh, no current encoder actually uses this. It only uh, it only indicates that uh, that the filter should go up, and uh, we actually are the first to to use this feature. So we we change uh, we change the, the basically the, the, the direction if we think that there is an energy disbalance between uh, between the high ends of the of the window and the low ends and this uh, does uh, does improve uh, PSNR quite a bit. Um, next, uh, you can have uh, up to four filters inside a single window, but again, no encoder actually uses uh, four filters. In fact, the most I've seen was two used by. Uh, uh, by uh, by libfdk AC, you can just uh, you know uh, get this value by just looking at the bitstream and uh, and uh, seeing uh, seeing what kind of uh, filters are used. We also use two windows usually, and uh, this was actually quite a surprise because the specifications explicitly say to basically just use a single filter to capture all the coefficients within the within the window and then filter them out. This did not work so well with especially with high frequency information. Maybe our decision system was bad, but uh, but once we split that into into two filters, so uh, so we take the coefficients and we split them among the two filters, uh, the results uh, got improved quite a bit. Next, uh, it uh, attempts to mark uh, mask basically quantization artifacts, so it tries to reduce the quantization noise down by boosting the coefficient itself, and then the decoder applies an inverse uh, an inverse filter where it uh, boosts the coefficients the coefficients down. And uh, this is the LPC pro uh, process outlined. Uh, you can see how you have uh, th you have the, this uh, you know uh, very thick black line uh, outlining the uh, the envelope. And uh, and uh, what the LPC coefficients do is they summarize the essentially they summarize the envelope of the spectral signal. So you can uh, you can see all the peaks in there, and you can see how uh, uh, how it basically average out averages out uh, in between the peaks. So this is what the LPC does, and uh, the resulting coefficient is what we actually use to uh, to apply the filter. But before we actually use those coefficients, we need to convert to reflection coefficients because the LPC uh, coefficients are usually uh, very very fragile. So you don't want quantization errors uh, accumulating there. So they're first converted to reflection coefficients, and the decoder of course converts them back to LPC coefficients where they are actually used to shape the signal. Now uh, there is a very specific uh, way of quantizing those uh, 
uh, those coefficients, and this is how the specifications demands that they are. Uh, the conversion to unsigned is actually uh, ignore that for now. It tries to use this uh, this kind of roundabout procedure where it uses a sign, and uh, of course, uh, when you see the uh, when you see the inverse quantization, it determines uh, whether the index is minus or plus. So that tells you that those coefficients are not going to be sent directly to the bit stream, and uh, and they have to be integerized. Uh, the, I mean, they have to be converted to unsigned first because you cannot really transmit uh, signed coefficients at, uh, at like four bits and you have an integer, so it, it, it doesn't work. It crashes, uh, it crashes the FFmpeg uh, uh, full bit system. So th this whole thing uh, got scrapped. I mean, it, it was refactored many, many times within like a few weeks, so uh, we found something which works the best. And the conversion to unsigned is basically how we did that uh, at the start when it was introduced. Uh, this is in fact uh, the uh, FAC, uh, libfac uh, uh, conversion to unsigned. This was copy pasted from libfac and uh, it doesn't really work as well and uh, sometimes you get errors with compilers and uh, yeah, thankfully we scrapped that because uh, the folks who decided to, to write the TNS uh, decoder and uh, application function noticed that they can uh, just uh, take the coefficients out. I mean, you have, uh, usually you transmit four bits for every coefficient, so you have four bits, uh, and each of those uh, can, uh, is then filtered through the, through the weird uh, sign and a sign procedure. So uh, you can just put them in a table, and uh, these are the tables for the four bits, uh, for the four bit signal, uh, the coefficients, which are sent to this string, and on the top you have the compressed version, and on the bottom you have the decompressed version. I mean the non-compressed version, and as you can see, the first four coefficients are exactly the same, and the next, uh, after the eleven coefficient, uh, they are again the same. So uh, if you if you just uh, took the uh, took the reflection coefficient and you just uh, found out which value it's uh, it's closest to, and you just encoded that into the bit stream, it's so much simpler, it's unbelievable, and. Uh, this is what uh, this is kind of what uh, FKAC does, except uh, it uses fixed point math, and it's it's confusing as hell. And uh, we have never actually copied any code whatsoever from either uh, FKAC or libfac. So this is uh, completely on our own. And uh, so you quantize, uh, uh, so you quantize the coefficients. Uh, you you put the filter direction, the coefficient bit size, which is usually either. Uh, it's usually four bits, but uh, when you have eight short windows, you don't really want that great of precision, so you uh, you auto that for uh, for uh, for a simple three-bit uh, coefficient in, instead. And um, yeah, I already mentioned we have up to four filters. And uh, wait, did I go back a slide? No, I didn't. I just copy this. Whatever. Instancity stereo, right? This is one of the uh, features which uh, which uh, works really well, and uh, again, uh, very few uh, encoders actually uh, use this feature. Uh, FKAC uses it sparingly, and uh, it's incredible because it allows you to not having to encode uh, a whole, uh, basically a whole uh, uh, group of, uh, of coefficients mapped to a single scale factor band. And it's, it mixes the spectral coefficients of both channels, it encodes the scaling as a scale factor and the phase as a band type. This is kind of weird because you, have, uh, you, have, you can have up to like 48 or 128 coefficients in a, inside a scale, single scale factor band and uh, each of them will have a separate phase, but at the end you're, you're basically required to summarize the phase inside of the, only a single variable. So one of the channels will have one phase and the other channel will have strictly the other phase. So, uh, so you really need to pick something which works well. And um, this is how the, uh, basically the uh, energy is determined. And in fact, this is how the psychoacoustic model uh, gets the energy. It just squares the coefficients and it sums them up inside a single square factor band, that is. And uh, the specifications weren't clear on how to get the sum channel energy, but this works the best. It just works the best. Just uh, take it as a gospel and uh, you know, put it in a book or, uh, or stones or whatever. Right, so uh, if you try to determine the phase using just a simple majority, it's not going to work this well. If you just try to get the average, uh, you're going to get horrible sounding results. And uh, the specifications actually add the uh, a red herring here because uh, it sounds horrible with them is switched on because you're required to invert the phase. But if you invert the phase, then most of the coefficients will have a wrong phase and uh, we end up with something horrible sounding. So we thought of a much better solution and it's to just uh, Measure the distortion for both phases. So you just uh, 
you just run your distortion, uh, your quantization function to get uh, uh, basically the cost to encode uh, the intensity stereo coefficients and the left and right channel. And uh, you need to, to repeat uh, this twice, but uh, it's worth it in the end. And we are an encoder, we can be as slow as we want to. You know, like uh, the DAWA guys over there. Hi, your, in <laughs> your encoder is incredibly slow. I just uh, wanted to let you know, but <laughs> yeah. It sure is. Yeah. Make it faster for us. Oh, I will. I will. <laughs> Believe me. All right. Uh, so you just use the pre-calculated energy values from uh, those formulas which I uh, shown, and you create IS coefficients. You compare the uh, the cost of the left plus right channels versus the IS channel, and you flag IS if the distortion is less. There's also uh, you have to use the the rate uh, uh, the rate constant in order to to uh, to kind of. Uh, you know, balance out uh, IS usage because you don't want to use it too much because after all, you do lose, uh, you do use, uh, lose uh, phase information. So next you have main prediction and uh, it's only uh, available in the uh, AC main profile. It operates on a single scale factor band. It predicts what else. And uh, actually the main uh, profile doesn't actually require any prediction to be flagged. So you can just use it as a way to extend the TNS filter to order 20 because uh, uh, someone decided it would be a nice idea to just degrade the TNS performance for uh, for ACLC. And uh, the way it does it is it creates predicted co coefficients from the previous frame. There are a huge list of formulas which are in the uh, in the original ISO specifications, MPEG-2. And uh, they're not very clear, so uh, so we thankfully just copy-paste it from the decoder and it works uh, very decent. We just needed to reorder some, uh, some things a bit. Um, so you feed them. Uh, so we feed all the predicted coefficients into the prediction formula, and uh, you replace any flag coefficients with the predicted er uh, prediction error. And as you know, uh, actually encoding using a Hoffman encoding, uh, smaller uh, small differences takes less bits. So you definitely want to keep the bit difference uh, down in between coefficients. So. Um, so you um, calculate the coefficients for the next frame, and you store them, and then you compare them. So, uh, so yeah, it's uh, it's kind of a, uh, yeah, a balancing out, and uh, you have to z reset always in case uh, in case uh, the window type is uh, eight short, which I have kind of said before. You uh, you have to also uh, make sure that all predictor groups have had a reset in the last two hundred and forty frames. This is. Uh, Required by the specifications so that you don't actually get any echoing for any long uh, harmonic uh, signals. So uh, I guess Mongolian troll singing is going to uh, have to be careful about this. Uh, then you have mid-side coding. I'm not going to talk much about it because it's mid-side coding. I mean, it's uh, it's used in plaque. It's uh, it's a very common technique to minimize uh, to minimize uh, uh, coefficient cost and uh, it exploits the fact that channels might have uh, similar coefficients so if you just store the sum and difference you can easily restore the original uh, the original one and hopefully it will cost less this is not enabled by default uh, we will enable it by default though and uh, it works reasonably well and, uh, and yeah nothing much to say about it uh, then you have pulses nothing actually uses pulses and uh, here's why uh, it operates uh, on a single, on exactly four coefficients within a single scale factor band. That means that uh, uh, it's a very, very, very uh, small set of situations in which uh, using pulses can actually make a difference. So we don't use it, FAG doesn't use it, FBK, AC doesn't use it, whatever magic uh, YouTube uses doesn't actually use it. So, uh, so it's kind of uh, in the specifications, but no one actually uses it because it's incredibly hard. I mean, the computation power required to calculate whether four, changing the amplitude of four coefficients is going to make a big difference is, uh, is not really uh, worth it at the end. So um, one actually uses it. Uh, Long-term prediction. Uh, it operates on a single scale factor band. It requires the ACLDB profile, but again, it's required, and it's mainly useful for speech. You don't want to go enabling it for any uh, high, you know, full band information. You want it for like very, very low bitrate speech, like below 10, uh, 10 kilobits or around 20 kilobits uh, around. Uh, but yeah, if you're if you're doing any content which requires that, uh, it basically uh, you should basically use Opus because. What's the point of using anything else? <laughs> Every single time I try to make comparison and Opus is just ridiculous. <laughs> What's the point of living? I don't want to develop anymore, but uh, I just keep pushing. 
and it's basically just a quick and dirty hack. It is, it is, I mean, it just uses the, uh, uh, the it's trapped onto the main prediction, but you will, you should never actually mark main prediction, because then you'll break the bitstream. So it's, uh, it's very weird, and uh, the way it interacts with, uh, with, um, with uh, channel uh, pairs, it's, uh, is all, because you're required to only summarize uh, everything within a single, uh, within a single uh, a channel. So, uh, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a really quick and dirty crack on extension. Then you have uh, the, the operation, so it gets the current roll time dependent samples, it feeds them into the autocorrelation algorithm, which tells you the lag value, so it points out to a previous point in the, uh, in the time signal, and it says, hey, there's, here's a part which kind of looks like your current coefficients here, you might actually reuse that. So you uh, get the amplitude value, so that basically means you get, uh, you get how much uh, amplification you have on the previous signal, and uh, you um, generate new coefficients, you, then in DCT and them, so you get uh, two sets of coefficients, the predicted and the uh, and uh, and uh, your current coefficients, and you mark whichever ones you think are appropriate. So um, yeah, that's it. Now I'm going to talk about a bit uh, about HCHE. Now uh, development of this feature started like uh, like a week ago, but it got paused because uh, because we want to. Uh, kind of remove the experimental flag so that people can stop bothering us finally. And uh, what it essentially does is, if you look at uh, C, D, and E down there, it uh, it gets, uh, it basically subsamples uh, your original audio signal at, uh, at half the sample rate. It copy pastes that into the uh, higher frequency and it uh, adjusts it through S, uh, SBR, spectral band replication. Uh, yeah, there's a whole lot of magic involved, and uh, I'm just starting to get through it all, so uh, bear with me, it's going to take some time. Uh, then you have parametric stereo, which, uh, which basically, um, yeah, it, it takes the coefficients for the left and right channels, it, um, it puts them into a mono, into a mono stream, and uh, using some, uh, some encoder and decoder magic, you're able to extract uh, the coefficients for the left and right. So yeah, just uh, bear with us. It's going to take a few days until we uh, remove the experimental flag from the uh, Git uh, from the Git repo. And uh, but once we do, uh, I invite everyone to post on uh, Hydrogen Audio or Zoom Nine so that uh, we can have our we can have our recorder dis dissected and uh, criticized and uh, blasted into oblivion because it sounds like uh, like crap. Hopefully it's not, and uh, I'm confident it does not. Uh, so any questions? Yeah. So. You if I remember correctly, AC main and uh, its features are belonging to MPEG-2 and whereas uh, uh, discarded in MPEG-4, so is a reason to care about them. Uh, about AC HE? No, main. Oh, main, main. Uh, well, yes, MTPS yes, are. there is, because it allows you to, first of all, extend the TNS filter so that it allows you to filter out uh, noise a bit better, and uh, it also, uh, it does save you quite a few bits. Uh, if uh, there's actually a, a whole uh, section on the on the in the specifications which outline that uh, you need to measure the bit cost for the predicted coefficients and the non-predicted coefficients, and if they're less, uh, then you use it. So it does. Uh, if you print it out uh, in the current uh, current encoder, it does save you like 500 or so bits. So it's not uh, it's not a small sum by uh, by any means. So. It does inc uh, in, uh, you know, increase quality a bit, so it's, it's something, it's there, all right? If you need high quality and uh, you want it easy, it's, it's there. Uh, the anyone else? Process. Yo. Uh, if, you had a, if you were encoding a song that yeah. was five minutes, Fair and enough. two and a half minutes mm -hmm. was the song, yeah. and then it literally repeated the same uh, no, no, no. Sadly, uh, sadly, we only do uh, long-term prediction for the long-term priorities. Uh, is only like uh, 2,048 coefficients, uh, which is basically just uh, kind of the size of your overlap. Since uh, since uh, we use MDCT, which basically means that uh, you use an overlap for the DCT. So you take the previous uh, your previous time samples, you get the new time samples, you put them against each other, and uh, you then DCT transform on those, and you get uh, 1,084 coefficients. But you're only allowed to use uh, lag, uh, which is the measure for the LTP uh, lag, within those coefficients, within the previous ones. For these songs, you just use MIDI. 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. Use MIDI. MIDI is awesome. I like MIDI. How many? What track? Um, Sorry? What track and module? Tracker module. Oh, tracker modules. Yeah, yeah. How many AAC subtypes does the encoder support? Uh, subtypes? You mean profiles? Like SSR, Objects. SBR. Uh, if you talk about profiles, we support uh, AC LC for now. We support AC main. We support uh, AC LTP, which hasn't been merged yet, and uh, and we support also the strict MPEG two type. So if uh, if a man called Nefcario is here, he is probably going to be a bit happy about that because uh, he's the only one demanding that feature be uh, be merged. <laughs> How many additional patents do we violate with the new code? Uh, well, around uh, you know this much and that much, so uh, you know, uh, you're a pirate. <laughs> you. So, uh, if I recall, main used these weird, wacky half floats, and if I tried to take the half floats out. Yes, yes, it does way. actually uh, use a weird trunc uh, truncation. It uh, basically requires you to truncate stuff to. I think it was sixteen. Uh, 16 bits, and you have to do, uh, and you have to do this truncation every time you want to store stuff inside the uh, inside the structure which contains the coefficient uh, parameters. So yeah, it's uh, it's uh, it, well, I'm not sure. I think it was made this way because uh, processors back then weren't very powerful in terms of doing uh, you know floating point calculations. But uh, but yeah. Anyone else? Uh, yo, yeah. Yo. I like that you call libfac libfuck. I think it actually accurately describes it. Libfuck, yes. About it's it. uh, <laughs> it's uh, how are you supposed to spell it? Lip, uh, F -A -C? F -A -C. Oh, well, it's <laughs> libfuck. Lip I mean, it's, it's, it, it kind of flows out of your mouth, so it's kind of hard to see that. But uh, but yeah, it's horrible. Libfuck is horrible. If you've seen the code, uh, you can kind of understand that's what, that's it. That's why the name uh, is so good. Uh, no, no, it's not good. It's naive as hell. For instance, if you if you've seen the uh, back uh, the main prediction for the uh, for uh, libfac, it um, it uses like uh, twenty loops to generate all the coefficient parameters when you could just merge them into one and use we just use a single loop and we just uh, call a function. But they just do everything so naively that you know you're like, how does this thing even work? We're better than libfac though. And I decay. What about, uh, say, enterprise encoders like, say, Dolbit? Uh, we haven't actually done any comparisons because, uh, A, I don't have the money to pay Dolby to give me such a, such an encoder, and B... Uh, well, it was it? licensed to Apple. Sorry? It was licensed to Apple, if I remember. Oh, it was licensed? Oh, yeah, so I guess Apple uses that one instead. Uh, uh, I don't actually know. I haven't done any comparisons. We have a Japanese dude called Kamido too, and he does all the comparisons. Uh, comparisons in that huge plus four hundred uh, uh, comment ticker, uh, you know, uh, ticket. And uh, and uh, I think uh, the last thing he tested was with seven C, which was kind of the previous uh, implementation of uh, Claudio's changes without any of mine. So uh, chances are, once we merge Claudio's changes and uh, once I push my final changes, which uh, I just need to push the LT LTP, uh, which isn't right now in Git, uh, Git main, because the hotel actually doesn't even allow me to get full, but uh, I will once I get back. And uh, once that happens, uh, the quality is going to jump right up, and I expect to be able to compare it to the AEC uh, encoder, which Apple uses. You. How do you test the how the inputting sounds? Uh, we, um, thankfully, we did not do a subjective test. This is not uh, uh, HEVC. I think HEVC actually used some subjective testing for this. And uh, we uh, mainly used uh, the, uh, basically, FFmpeg has paid, which is the FFmpeg uh, automated test environment. And, uh, and, um, and if you don't actually pass the uh, paid test, it gives you a PSNR value, which is kind of a liar. It's a very big liar, but it's still a very good indication on how uh, how well uh, 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 what's the similarity between the original source and uh, and your current encoding source. So uh, so yeah, we use that we use subjective testing because at the end of the day, sometimes you get some crazy result like a PSNR of uh, of increase of like two units, and if you just listen to this to whatever you're encoding, it sounds like low pass filter garbage. So yeah, it's it, it's fine, but it's but it's there and. Uh, yeah, it provides some solid, uh, solid test results. Actually, I know a story that one encoder. Sorry. 
So I know a story that one enterprise a CN code started to use a automatic metric uh, yeah. new quality. Yeah. And it actually degraded in output quality after that. Really? Uh, yes. Well, the DAO guys uh, are all about PSNR and... Uh, it it just <laughs> does not work as good uh, for audio. Yeah, it's not, as good for audio. it's not as good for audio, but it's there, so... Uh, it's just a secondary precaution, so you don't have to listen to the entire thing to see if there's any garbage. It's a nice metric, but it's there and we use it. Anyone else? Yo! Plan to support constant bitrate. Uh, constant bitrate. Uh, yes, we mainly use uh, constant bitrate. So if you don't actually specify any bitrate right now in the FFmpeg, uh, you know, parameters, it's going to assume a bitrate of uh, 120 28 uh, kilobits. We uh, we don't. Uh, I haven't actually played around much with uh, with variable bitrate, uh, but uh, but I'm sure I'll get around to it. Anyone else? No. All right, then you have a, a coffee break.